So we get to today's speaker. <laughs> I recently discovered that we have been shorting this speaker on her titles. <laughs> I attended another <laughs> talk by Reverend Jan, and they did it right. They introduced her as Reverend Dr. Jan Limburg Morgan, <laughs> who has been a long time religious. But yes, please. <laughs> uh, wait, wait, I'm not done. <laughs> There's still so much more to say. <laughs> so she's been a religious science minister for many decades, but what I appreciate most about her is that she knows exactly who she is and who each of us are as well. And she keeps reminding us of that. Those of us who were with her on Friday in the spiritual spa know this very well about her. And the title of her talk is Mothers and Other Goddesses. Re De Reverend Doctor, to you. <laughs> Nina reduced me to tears. In a earlier phase of my life that ended eight years ago, I used to play the Native American flute. And I have quite a large collection of them. And they haven't been out of the container for eight years. And so now my knees are shaking. <laughs> What's next? And Dr. Rita. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Again. May something that I say today find a place in your heart, that it may go with you and nourish you throughout this coming week. Did I do that? No. Okay. <laughs> Tacky, I'm not. <laughs> A little girl is watching her mother wash the, dish the dishes, and she notices that her mother has some white hairs among her brunette ones. And she says, Mom, why are some of your hairs white? Well, every time a little girl misbehaves and makes her mommy unhappy, one of mommy's hairs turned white. The child thinks about this for a minute, and then she says, boy, you must have really ticked off grandma. <laughs> My talk today is, could someone that knows something about this help me raise this thing a little bit? Not much, just enough to, so I don't, not bending. Thank you. It's somewhat of a potpourri on the subject of mothers, goddesses, beauty, and balance. How many of us here believe in coincidence? Oh, really? Okay. I don't, I have a sneaky feeling it's all planned, but <laughs> I was well into preparing my talk and I found an article in the May, June, July Unity magazine. Any of you seen this? Well, that's the May, June, July. And in it, there's an article called In Plain Sight by Reverend Maggie Whitehouse. And Reverend Whitehouse goes far beyond my intent for this talk. However, our conclusions are in alignment. Growing up in Wales, I went to church on Mothering Sunday. Uh, the history of that was over 300 years before. This day was set aside for those who lived in their employers' homes so they could go home and spend one day with their mothers. Um, I would say this was clearly before minimum wage and regulated <laughs> hours, wouldn't you? So Mothering Sunday honored 
the women who were mothers. But somewhere along the way, at some point throughout all of Europe, the churches interjected themselves into this celebration and eventually the focal point of Mothering Sunday became the Mother Church, superseding the honoring of the personal mother. And the further we go back in history, celebrating the as feminine aspect of God is not a new concept, but for a long time it was an abandoned concept. What's new is not having both the feminine and the masculine aspects of the deity at the core of our spiritual beliefs. New as in the last two millennia, 2000 years. In the earliest versions of Genesis, Genesis verse one, I mean, chapter one, verse one states, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim, is a feminine noun translated as God. Yahweh, generally regarded as the masculine, wasn't introduced until the second chapter of Genesis. This was in the old, the very early issues of Genesis. Yahweh translates to Lord. So Yahweh Elohim, Lord God. I'm speaking now of the Christian tradition, but stepping outside of Christianity, the ancient people of the world honored and worshiped goddesses as well as gods. One of the oldest references is to Gaia, believed she existed before time began. Eternal prehistoric mother earth, fertility incarnate, it was believed that everything that lives, breathing or not, overflows with her life and the energy of life itself. The ancients believed that all bodies return to her black fertile soil and all new life springs from her. The triple goddess, the goddess with three faces, is also found under various other names throughout the many different spiritual traditions across the world, going back many, many centuries. The triple goddess symbolizes every aspect of existence from birth to death and beyond. The virgin, strong, self-defined. The mother, nurturing the source of all nourishment the crone, the goddess of death and transformation. Changing woman, woman, changing woman revered by the Native Americans, even to this day, the Native Americans specifically of the Southwest. She changes from a baby to an old woman with all the stages in between. She's the source for them of all abundance, of all life, and she teaches people how to live in harmony with all things. And she's still very much a part of the life today. The ancient Egyptians worshiped Isis, the mother, the giver of all life, total femininity. The Chinese Buddhists, it is the goddess of mercy, devoted to saving humankind. In Polynesia, it's Pile. In Wales, it's Rhiannon. And in Asia, it's Kuan Yin. Each a revered face, feminine face of God. Throughout the ages, the masculine face of God has been called many things. Allah, Buddha, Yahweh, Jehovah, Spirit, and many other names that we know nothing about. The goddess represented omnipotence, love, sacrifice and transformation, not to the exclusion of the masculine, but as an integral part of the whole, both moving together in the dance of deity. 
in new thought, unity, science of mind, divine science, we refer to the Father, Mother, God, the thinker behind all thought, the creator behind all creation. Recognizing that the I am has no specific gender, the mother, father, God in the act of creating all that is. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story of a family, Kathy and Jim and their two children, Leslie, 17, and Vince, 14. It's a story of courage, of great pain, of love and renewal. It was the summer of the year 2000 and Leslie and Vince were invited to go water skiing for the day with friends at a nearby lake. The night before, Kathy reviewed water safety with them. And when she left to work the next morning, she kissed them both, they were still in bed. And she was uneasy all day and sent silent words of prayer for their safety. In the late afternoon, she got a call from Jim. The children were in separate hospitals with major injuries from a car accident. Leslie had been driving, no drugs, no alcohol, no speed, none of those involved. There was no explanation on the part of the authorities for the accident. Kathy rushed to one hospital, Jim to another. The doctor met Kathy and told her that Vince was dead. He appeared to be sleeping until she saw the extent of his head injuries. She met Jim in the hall and his first words were, Vince must be all right. Leslie had died. They moved in a fog. I'm sorry, this really does affect me and I'm wondering why I'm telling it to you, but it is such a beautiful story that I need to. They moved in a fog for many months, unable to comprehend that their children were gone. Kathy was 42 and unable to have any other children. And one night she got a phone call from her younger sister, Mary Ann. If you want to have another child, I will have one for you. This is something I can do for you and it'll be my honor to do it. After much prayer and talking, Jim and Kathy decided to take Mary Ann up on her offer. Mary Ann's husband, David, and their three children were totally united behind her. Several doctors refused to do the procedure but one very enthusiastically came on board. Mary Ann received Kathy's egg and Jim's sperm. And three weeks later, they got the news that she was pregnant with their child. Mary Ann was uncomplaining through the entire pregnancy and gave birth to a beautiful little boy they called Max, who physically resembled both of his older siblings. Now, Max is not a replacement for Kathy and for Leslie and Vince. He's a gift given to Kathy and Jim by God through the goddess Mary Ann. A gift beyond their comprehension. Kathy regrets that he will never meet his older brother and sister, but she believes that at a soul level, he already knows them. It wasn't just Mary Ann's, Mary Ann that gave the gift. David lovingly supported his wife throughout the process and the pregnancy. The three children contributed what was theirs to do to support their mother in this. The father, mother, God, harmoniously giving the gift. The question for me isn't how do we tie it all together? Rather, it's how can we possibly separate 
the gift of new life, excuse me, separate one thing from another, how to differentiate between the goddess of ancient times and the beautiful woman that gave her sister the gift of new life. Between the masculine Yahweh and the devoted husband who was there supporting it all, how do you separate it? It's all, it all works perfectly together. I don't think we can tie it all together or separate it because it is, it is as it is. All, all is part of the magnificence of creation, of the thinker behind the thought, the creator behind the creation, and it's all God. I'm going to tell you the stories of two women. I'm not going to give you the names, but you will know. First one was born on August 26, 1910. At 18 years old, she left home and joined the Sisters of the Loretto Abbey in Rathfarham, Ireland to learn English. She never saw her mother and sister again. In 1929, she went to Jarjeeling, India and learned Bengali. She taught at St. Teresa's School, a nearby convent, and eventually became fluent in five languages, Bengali, Albanian, Serbian, English, and Hindi. She taught for 17 years and then was called to serve the poorest of the poor. She walked the streets of Calcutta in 1948, begging for food and a place to sleep and volunteers gathered around her. In 1950, the Vatican gave, gave permission to form the Missionaries of Charity. And in 1997, the original congregation of 13 had grown to 4,000 sisters managing orphanages, AIDS hospitals, and charity centers worldwide. They cared for refugees, the blind, the disabled, the aged, the alcoholics, the poor and the homeless, and victims of flood, famine, and epidemics. <laughs> she died on September 5th of 1997. But by 2007, the missionaries of charity included over 5,000 sisters, 450 brothers worldwide operating 600 missions, schools, and shelters in 120 countries. Of course, you know I'm talking about Mother Teresa. Wow. Wow. I've done a lot of things in my life. I'm not sure if I could visualize walking the streets of a city like Calcutta begging for food. Wow. The other one was born in London on April 1934. As a child, instead of teddy bears, she had stuffed chimpanzees and she loved them. At age five, she hid in the hen house to find out where eggs came from. <laughs> and her frantic mother didn't scold her. She listened to her story. Her dream was to live in Africa, to watch and write about animals, but she couldn't afford to go to university. So she became a secretary in London. And a friend invited her to their farm in Kenya. So she gave up her job in London, went to live with her mother in Bournemouth, which is on the south coast of England, served as a waitress as she saved and earned and saved the money for her boat fare to Africa. She met Dr. Lewis Leakey when she arrived in Africa, famous anthropologist and paleontologist. And he hired her 
as his secretary assistant. She said, I wanted to come as close to talking to animals as I could. The British authorities wouldn't allow her to live alone among the wild animals in Africa, so her mother volunteered to join her. Gradually, they won the animals over. They accepted her presence. It took two years to be accepted and not to be seen as a threat in the jungle. She was the first one to report them hunting for meat and observed the making and using of stick tools with which they could reach the meal of termites out of the wood. She proved that chimps had a discernible language with over 20 sounds. These things had thought to be, been thought to be strictly human traits, not an animal trait. She was among the few people who earned a PhD from Cambridge University without a prior degree. And she went on to achieve other firsts in understanding animals and advocating for their rights. She recently stated, apparently referring to both people and animals, every individual counts. Every individual has a role to play. Every individual makes a difference. Mother Teresa astounded the world by sharing her love with the disadvantaged and the marginalized. Jane Goodall did the same with animals, primarily but not limited to chimpanzees. These women display for me the act of mothering. And I selected them because they are part of the fabric of our history. They displayed what a dream and a desire, how it can be brought about with life-changing compassion and service. I know I have quoted this so many times to you, but you know I'll keep right on doing it. <laughs> Mother Teresa said, you, we can't all do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. And Jane Goodall, re-quoting her, every individual counts. Every individual has a role to play. Every individual makes a difference. They've inspired many of us to be part of the world's positive future. Thousands of people across the globe changing the world with acts of loving service. Reverend Whitehouse in her article says, for more than 2,000 years, humanity has exempted itself from the one natural law that rules the earth, the law of limited competition. It only takes one species to refuse to live according to this law for the system eventually to break down completely. We only have to look at the conditions of our oceans. The land masses laid to waste by mining. The wildlife habitats decimated by industry. The rivers and lakes that are polluted with our waste. Species that have been declared extinct because we have encroached on their, living, their areas of living to where they no longer could survive. It's more about, it's, it's more than living life in balance and harmony with each other. It's about living in balance and harmony with mother nature. We can't continue to march, march forward oblivious to the needs of the rest of life on earth. It's time to find a gentler, more humane and natural way to handle the earth and all forms of life, animals and growing things. 
of finding ways to produce what we need and leave the earth better than we found it. Examples are to restore the wildlife habitats, recycling and using waste to provide beneficial products. An aside, I watch a show on YouTube called Escape to the Country. It's a British show. It's about people looking to move away from the cities to the country and these hosts showing them houses in the area they want to live. And always they include a little segment of what is going on in that particular county. And frequently they will show areas where because of mining or whatever, the ground has been threatened, the plant life is dying, the, the wildlife can't survive there, and they will show how groups are restoring that. One of them showed how a group of farmers took the waste from cows, they store it in a huge container which produces me methane gas and some other form of energy that is then piped to the farms and reused. That was just a little that I remember that always moves me so much. So how can we serve on a personal level? We can choose to travel across the planet or we can choose to travel across town. Whether we choose Woods Humane Society the Food Pantry, the Five Cities Co Homeless Coalition, a hospice organization, or a Peace Corps type organization worldwide, serving in any capacity, in any volunteer position, is doing small things with great love. And maybe for some of us, there's a reason we can't volunteer. We know it may not be a Mother Teresa or a Jane Goodall, but we can spread love on all life around us. We can have an impact on the people and the animals on the planet Earth by being nurturing, loving, and giving. This, to me, is what mothering is all about. We can be the love we wish to see in the world. I wasn't going to add this, but I invisibly got my arm twisted. During the spiritual spar, I shared with the ladies the mantra that I recite before I do my prayer work. I, I am part of a group and we do prayer work for a lot of people. But this is, and I, what, I'm, what I'm giving to you, I want, if you would please sit with your eyes closed and take these words as your own. Be saying them with me as I say them. I know who I am. I am a beloved of the divine. I am a unique creation of the one creator. I am an integral aspect of the universe. I am a being of love and light. And that which is true for me must be true for all beings. Namaste.